This is Star Talk, Cosmic Queries Edition. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And we can't do uh, Cosmic Queries without Chuck Nice. Chuck, hey, welcome back. Neil. That, and by All the right. way, y- you could. And <laughs> <laughs> you okay. say you can't do it I was just lying. I, you I'm sorry, say, I was lying. You're being, was like, you're being kind to me. You're being kind, and okay. I appreciate it. <laughs> you know, you're like, we couldn't do this without Chuck Nice, but I've actually <laughs> seen shows where you have. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Damn, called me. I thought I could slip that one by, but apparently not. Okay. Uh, uh, but good to have you, Chuck. Always and good. we we've got a special guest. We, we a guest we've never had, and I don't know how she came went under our radar for so many years. Yeah. We've got Allie Ward with us. Allie, welcome to Star Talk. I'm here. I'm I'm so happy to um, to incite such excited stammering. Here I am. No one can believe I'm here. <laughs> least of all me. Uh, uh, Hi. <laughs> so you've got quite the thing going on. You've you've taken ownership of all the ologies of the universe and have delivered them them back to us in digestible bites, not only in your Twitter stream, but in podcasts and and videos. So this is just, I love it. And, and, but this is not your first rodeo really, right? You've been at this Psy Ed stuff for a while. I Um, have, And what, what was Innovation Nation? What was that? Oh, I'm still doing it. We're on uh, season eight right now. And, uh, Ouch! Wow! I know! Oh season eight, God. going into season nice. nine any second now. Okay. So, uh, do, is there, any, on, on is there any, any fear you might run out of innovations? No, they keep inventing them. That's the wonderful <laughs> thing. <laughs> People keep making stuff. So who knows? And what do you have going on? And what do you have going on Netflix? Brainchild? What's that about? Yeah. So um, Innovation Nations on CBS. It's with Mo Rocca. It's different yeah. innovations. And then on Netflix, I'm on Brainchild, which is a kid science show, and 100 Humans. And I consult on a new show uh, called Ada Twist Scientist. It's coming out pretty soon. I'm very excited about it. Aid a what scientist? Uh, Ada Twist, scientist. So that's a person, right? She's a, yes, she's yes. It's a, an animated. She's a person. Yes, it's oh, an animated oh, kid show. Oh, well, I thought you All said aid a twisted scientist, and I didn't <laughs> oh, know what that meant. Okay, fine. Be um, fine. A By the way, just going to say that Ada does have her problems, so you might be <laughs> right, Neil. <laughs> and what is? Did I mention invention? What's that? Oh, that's another show that I host for CW. And uh, jeez, so what? What? Just, what, 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 just I know. I know. Damn. It's a little crazy. And uh, I've been working with the Obama's company to higher ground, doing some consulting for uh, Waffles and Mochi. So I don't Name drop. Did I hear that? Name drop. Name drop. Oh, have you heard of them? Yeah, yeah. Name drop. Every once in a while, you know, Michelle and Barack just come by and- (laughs) I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying anything. I'm just, you know, every once in a while they'll stop by and we talk, and we talk about, you know, mochi and waffles while we actually eat waffles. It's yeah. awesome. It's just amazing. But yeah. wait, 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 wait. So also, uh, okay, wait, mochi. That's that Japanese candy. Is that right? Yes, yeah. Yes. That's the name of a of a kids show all about food and nutrition. Right. Mrs. Obama is in right because because you're also a food person. I did some work for Cooking Channel. I did some work for Cooking Channel. I had a job for Cooking Channel where they made me go to bakeries and eat like 16 donuts a day and describe them, which is great the first couple seasons. (laughs) I had a show on the Food Network close to Mochi and Waffles, and it was called (laughs) Chicken and Waffles, You Gonna Die. So uh, (laughs) You're Gonna Die. (laughs) (laughs) Wait, so after the second season, they would just roll you to the... To the next yeah. bakery. Because. Yeah, you'd be on an off camera. You'd be on an insulin drip. It was. Uh, wow. it was pretty I know. intense. Right, right. Pretty intense. I'm much happier wow. in the science space. <laughs> but yeah, so I juggle all these things, and the the worst part about all of the jobs is that I like them all, and so I don't know which ones to quit. So I just stay up late and work on everything. I just drink a lot. Of well, coffee. let me say something here, if I can, if I can, just I don't want to sound like you know, father time on the porch on the rocking chair, but. Okay. Uh, you have a background that would not immediately indicate that you do exactly this, but your background is all the background you need to do exactly this, right? So, so there are people, there there are students who study acting because they want to be an actor, 
right? So they go to law school, he's going to be a lawyer, business school, you're in business. And you do these things, and now you invented all of this stuff because that is that melange of talent now unique to you, and that can only manifest in products that are the unique paw print of what you bring to it. That makes me feel a lot better about job security, I'll have to say. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like, rest easy. Well, you Tell know, that to your parents who said, where did we go wrong? <laughs> She's not on the bench. <laughs> but I mean, you know, I think that really one thing I've learned from Ology so much is that the people that I interview are so passionate about what they study, whether they're a bufologist studying toads or they're someone who is a fire ecologist or whatever, they tend to really love their jobs. And so I think I've really learned from doing ologies is figure out what you love the most and then just gravitate toward that because you're going to be the best at that. Passionology. So, so, so yeah. it's the it's, study of watching people get excited about their work. Yeah. I just invented an ology. Right. So there. So I can actually that, use that. Now that you've said it, I can use it. So okay, well, I didn't then, invent it. You did. Maybe maybe there's an ology for my passion, buttology. Is there... You know who I had on? I did do gluteology with Natalia Reagan, who has been on Star Talk a bunch. So she yes, we uh, yes, she's a yes. friend of Star Talk. We talked all about butts. We talked because all the primate about butt is a whole thing with yep. the orangutan. Yep. yep, talked about gluteology and the Check mandrill. The yeah, the the big red yeah, butt. Yeah, gluteology. That's what it's gluteology. called. Gluteology. Okay. Yep, gluteology. So do humans have the biggest butts? Humans have the biggest butts, right? We of do. All the, mm. We do. Primates. And I'm going to use first person plural on that. I'm going to include myself on that. We do have the biggest <laughs> butts. <laughs> right. That's very kind of yeah. you. The you're, juiciest of rumps. That's very inclusive of you. Yes, it very is. Inclusive. You're, you're a big fine primate when you back that thing up. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And for a reason. So yeah, you can listen to, um, to her episode and learn all about it. But that's kind of, I realized I was really good at being curious and and just nosy enough to be uncomfortable in some situations. So it turns out- got to, You need yeah. that because that gets you beyond the, the edge of your comfort zone, yeah. which is always important. Otherwise, nothing new shows up. And what did you study in school? I studied science. I loved science. And I also loved fine art. And so I was studying illustration and science, and I couldn't decide which way to go. And I thought maybe mm -hmm. I would do both. But I ended up- um, as a double major in biology and film. And so I yeah. kind of TV and science ended up working. It, it's so funny well, there it is. that you, you keep- And you're the full manifestation of that. That's great. And, mm -hmm. and then she, if you notice, Neil, if you notice, there's a very distinct dichotomy in her choices. One actually pays money where you can get a job <laughs> and the other one doesn't. So <laughs> she's like, <laughs> fine art and science. Which one can I live on? <laughs> which one? Which one? Biology and television. Hmm. I mean, ask a grad student, though. There are grad students listening saying, do you know how much grad students make? Wait, Ali, let me put Chuck in his place here. I can put Chuck in his place. Please do. Your fine art infuses mm -hmm. the depth and elegance of everything else you do. So no, you may not be specifically making money from the fine art. Mm -hmm. Everything else you're doing is enhanced by it. Yeah, I tried to say that. I tried to tell my mother that when I went into <laughs> comedy. comedy? I, tried, yeah. I, tried to, I tried to do the same thing, Neil. Did not work. Did not work. <laughs> Did not work. Okay. <laughs> She's like, you need to infuse some money into this rent. How about that? Infused. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. There is, a, there is an ology for that. Gelatology is a study of humor. And I interviewed someone who told me he was, it's uh, Dr. Burke down in Loma Linda. He studies the effects of laughter on on medical patients, and he is a man who is serious about laughter. And it was one of the driest interviews I've ever done, which I thought was absolutely perfect because he's so wait, serious. Wait, wait, wait. So, wait, 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 wait. So, <laughs> so if you say, I was laughing so hard, I was in stitches. <laughs> That would have extra meaning to it him. It probably would. It right. probably, I think. Because if I, if, or, or if I bust out my stitches, I don't want to laugh too hard. You know, if I'm in the hospital trying to recover, I don't want Chuck too near me because I might laugh too hard. <laughs> yes. You could just say, I was laughing so hard, I was lengthening my telomeres is uh, a better way to say it. Oh, uh, good. So you live, I like you live that. longer yeah. when you laugh. Is that the deal? Yeah. I That's love, the I, deal. Okay. Yeah, you want to, you want to, the telomeres are good, good. Mm -hmm. but Chuck, you, we have questions for yes. Ali, is that right? That is mm -hmm. right. We're solicited from we our fan base. This was so much fun, this, I forgot we were doing a, uh, this, a Cosmic Queries. Cosmic Queries, yeah. Yeah. So. What do you have for us? Okay, so uh, let's just start off with Adam Crowther, or Crowther, it's C-R-O-W -C and then Thur. So Crowther, Crowther, I don't know. Anyway, 
He says, thank you for this opportunity to ask the question. Chuck, you never know. So you <laughs> never know. So, so okay, I, go on. I wish I could refute that. <laughs> Oh, I can't. <laughs> you can't. Okay, here we yeah, go. Okay. He says, thank you for the opportunity to ask this question. I have friends and family who have been convinced that COVID vaccination is useless against the disease and it will be harmful to our health. They are motivated by the general distrust of conventional medicine and faith in alternative so-called holistic and spiritualistic healing methods and their strong belief in the paranormal. Ooh. So um, he says, how do I approach this discussion, Adam. So uh, you're a person who studies everything. I do. Everything, yeah. So mm -hmm. how do you, what do you, what do you bet? How do you, how? how? <laughs> <laughs> Essentially. No, no, let me, let me back up. Let me, let me yeah. better formulate this. Each of the fields that you dip your toes in or, or full body in mm -hmm. require some sensitivity to the vocabulary, the jargon, the what's interesting, what's not. And so you have to think this through. And somewhere in there, you would have come up with methods, tools, and tactics of communicating what needs to get out there. So what have you? What can you share with us on this topic? Well, you know, I was lucky enough to study biology, and I used to read a lot of journals for fun when I was in college. I was uh, a dork. So luckily I have that kind of background. But, um, you know, things like this, when it comes to communicating science that I always try to start from is just empathy and understanding where someone's coming from, whether it is asking a scientist to share their work or whether it's trying to get these ideas to the public. And so I think, of course, there's things that are infuriating about this, but if you are with someone who does not want to understand science or is blocked to it, always come from an empathetic standpoint of what are they scared of. I think typically fear is what blocks us off from a lot of learning. So what are they scared of? This would of? come from yeah. psychology. Yes, an ology <laughs> indeed. <laughs> um, so See what yeah, I did I there? Am I good? Am I good? Loved it. I'm good. Loved it. Haven't done that episode uh -huh. yet. Too broad a topic. Okay. But yeah, but, um, but the the idea that the empathy at least doesn't have them dig their heels in more yeah. strongly, you, you might be able to find a place to have that conversation. Yeah, uh, I mean a space, a conversational space. Yeah, there's no, there, it, you don't do any good if you are, um, if you are being condescending to someone or patronizing or if you are annoyed at them for their beliefs. It doesn't uh -oh. do anyone good. You don't uh -oh. get, it doesn't help anyone. Well, I'm so. doing this whole thing wrong because I have <laughs> I have the Fred Sanford uh, approach. Shut up, dummy. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> but, yeah, he did say that, yeah. didn't he? Uh, yeah. Does, yeah. 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 Does not open a lot of minds. So try to address what they're scared of and then try to perhaps talk to them about how scary the other alternative is, which, you know, in this, in terms of vaccinations. So, um, so what you're saying is you're an idiot is not a good opener. I find <laughs> no. Because that well, might so, a good Ali, closer to, if they don't listen to you. We, we have to get you back on another show the week before Thanksgiving, before everyone goes home. Yes. So that the Thanksgiving dinner conversations can, so no one dies. Yep. All right. We'll have the special... <laughs> Yeah. No. I have two We're... ologies for you, though. We do have vaccine infodemiology, um, which premiered in January, has a lot of information, has a lot of talk about vaccine hesitancy and where those come from, from a historical, psychological place, and agnotology, which is the study of willful ignorance, which is a real study. And I talked to a Stanford professor about that. So those episodes wow. are there in case you want to understand why some people wow. just don't Wow. Okay, very lesson. good. I like, I like the overview there. Very <laughs> yeah. good. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more Q&A with the queen of ologies, <laughs> <laughs> Ali Ward on Star Talk. We're back, Star Talk Cosmic Queries Edition. I got Chuck with me, and Chuck, we have a guest. I don't know what, how we missed her the past eight years that we've been doing this. Uh, Ali Ward, welcome, welcome to Star Talk. And I'm here. how do we I'm find excited. you on Twitter? Oh, how do we just find you on Twitter? At Ali Ward, A L I E W A R D, or Ologies. Just at Ologies on everything. I sat on those handles. I got them. They're mine. Ologies. Nice. So yeah. you own Ology. I do. I do. I couldn't Damn. believe the handles were I don't were know if available. that's a good thing or a bad thing. I, I oh. have to think about that. <laughs> it's a good you know. thing. Yeah, Trust yeah, me. If you, if you turn evil, 
Mm -hmm. Then to control the ologies is you become a superhero uh, uh, nemesis by yeah, doing so. No, that's my plan. Yeah, my plan is to ruin everything. <laughs> uh, you're just seeing part of my backstory now. So if someone's going to wrong me, and then this I'm going to use everything. This is story yeah. right now. Yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, Chuck, we have to be nice to her because yes. no telling what powers she's in. We might turn her into an evilologist. Yep. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Lightning's going to come out of my eyes. I'm going to own the world. It's going to be great. There you go. <laughs> so, Chuck, we, we solicited questions specifically for her in this on, on her mm. ology um, mm. universe. So okay. what do you have there? Uh, this is Chapter Lipschitz who says, uh, hey, what's up? Stellar Star Talk crew, Neil and Chuck. Chester Lipschitz here with the question about ancient science. Hmm. Clearly man-made discoveries before language, even though they did not formally fall into today's definition of science, do you think there would have been a limit to the advancement of civilization without language? Ooh. Interesting. I like that. I'm so, Ali, have you interviewed any 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 linguists or anybody who's thought about this language in the brain? And I haven't, I haven't. But I want to mm -hmm. say, obviously, I guess it de depends on how you define language because there are so many animals that use language and have different ways of communicating. So, are you talking? Are they talking about just written language? Or are they talking about um, like certain word. syntax? Because there's, I mean, there are different primate. There are monkeys and uh, that have different dialects in terms of where they grow up in certain. I'm rainforests. thinking every. I'm thinking every species of animal on Earth has no trouble communicating with other members of its species. species. Mm -hmm. All right. I mean, you look at ants and bees and birds, and and they're just having a doing fine. And I bet cavemen or you know the cave people they without a dictionary and a language and a school i'm sure they communicated with each other yeah. when they were hungry when they needed more food when they're sleepy i mean so so maybe let's maybe we should tune the question a little tighter and ask uh maybe basic discoveries could be communicated but not subtle nuances of discoveries, which would require a more sophisticated way of communication. What do you think of that? Uh, uh, that's my answer, and I'm sticking to it. It's a good answer. A, I think we would find those nuances because the same way we found nuances for when you're deaf or when you're blind, we always seem mm -hmm. to find a way to communicate with each other as, as, as human beings. And even right. if we didn't have that, we would just find a way to communicate those nuances. It would be interesting to look at, yeah, written language and technology and if they follow a similar curve, if there's a certain like limiting factor. I don't know, but I will say that I want to just deconstruct the question in terms of what is language, because I think that we have a very narrow definition of that um, in terms of like what is human written language and and, uh, and the way that we communicate. So that's what I say. I say, yeah, go back good. to your question, retinker the language of your question, and then we'll, we'll re-answer it. Ooh, okay. <laughs> That's what I say. Damn, just send him back hey, to the drawing hey, board. Hey, Allie. Chester. Hey, Allie. <laughs> yeah. We have to be here next week, okay? <laughs> no. Chester, I think it's a good question, Chester. I do. I do. I would just want to deconstruct a little bit. Uh, how about this? How about this? Let, yeah. me, uh, let me leapfrog this and say okay. science as we now think of it took great leaps and advances only after scientific journals became the common way discoveries were shared, oh. not only within a country, but across national boundaries, speaking whatever was the agreed upon language of the day. Right. And you go back several hundred years, it was Latin, mm -hmm. the right. language of the erudite and the scientific communication. That's when it really took a, exactly. uh, took a jump. So I have to say, whether or not it's spoken language, the simple act of communicating a discovery at a distance mattered greatly. Yeah. There you go. And, you're, and you know what? That's so interesting because that's where the codification comes in is the fact that you're able to have these, you know, um, records so that you can go back and compare and then compare oh, yeah. across distances. You don't have to reinvent something you don't have next to year. Reinvent yeah. something. We have the record. Right. Yeah, not only the, the record of what's been discovered, but the record of, of, of dead ends. So right. you don't have to repeat the mistakes of people who came before you. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. You Great job. All right. Okay. Good All right, keep going. That was awesome. All right, here we go. Uh, Tom says... Um, C-E-Z, so I don't know. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> he says, I think being 
nice is better for teaching the scientific method. What were, were no, sorry, what are the verified experiments showing which teaching methods are best? Ugh. Yeah, so, so Ali, what's this field? I mean, other than the field of education, is there an ology associated with that? I think I had, I had Bill Nye on, pedag Mm -hmm. Pedagogology. Now, he? He? he is this guy. He's um. <laughs> don't, who's that guy? He's no, a just, young. Don't, don't just 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 just. <laughs> he keep just talking. started. No. Just started. He's just starting out in his career. Okay. And, um, <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we talked about science communication, and um, he essentially was talking about how you shouldn't introduce a concept with a big word first, you should talk about the concept first and then define it instead of just dropping a big word. Essentially, I think not alienating people is the biggest hurdle to get over with science communication. So I guess I would err on the side of being nice in terms of trying to be as inclusive as possible and have it be a welcoming space. Because I think one thing about science that intimidates people especially lay people, is they think that scientists are all in lab coats. They know everything. They don't break anything. They don't make any mistakes. They don't fail at anything. They are just imbued with knowledge. They don't realize that scientists... Inaccessible, are, inaccessible yes. to them. Yeah. They don't realize okay. that scientists are just really curious people who do a lot of experiments that mess up a lot until they find an answer. So I think trying to mm -hmm. come at it from a more humanistic, like, hop on board, learn what you can, instead of a get out of here I and like that. idiot. Mm. I'd like that rather than think of it as something up on the ivory tower hill yeah. that you have no access to. Very yeah. good. All right, I like and that. And I also I think like the that. more varied uh, backgrounds we have in science, the different questions people ask. I think if you have the same people in science, they're going to ask the same kind of questions of their experiments. And mm -hmm. I think that's one thing I really love about doing ologies is having all these different types of scientists who approach their research based on their own background. So yeah, I think hop on in. We need as many scientists as possible. So mm -hmm. nice. Nice is better. Okay. I cool. think. No, I, I agree. All right. All right. Very cool. So uh, thanks for the uh, supercilious answer, Allie. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, English yes. humor. Okay. Loved here we go. it. <laughs> here we go. Stephen Som Somers wants to know this. He says, hey, say you've spoken on TV or a podcast to a huge audience with total confidence in your idea only to find out later that you got something wrong. How do you set the record straight when that happens? Mm, that's a great question. That I is a great question. One thing I recommend if people struggle with this is just take what you need from your house and go live in a cave for the rest of your life. <laughs> Don't show your face again. Remove yourself from society. Uh, you failed, it's all over, is what I would say. Um, no, that's not what I'm saying. Mm, okay. I would say- uh, Chuck, you're issue. right. We do have to be here next week. And <laughs> <No>. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know, I think one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that science is evolving. There are so many things we thought about science and then we did more experiments and learned something else. And so understanding that science and just knowledge, human knowledge is always elastic. It's always changing. You may have been wrong. That's great. Admit it. Cop to it issue a correction on Twitter and Instagram and on your website and move on with your life. I think- um, Wait, wait, but uh, Ali, there are two kinds of wrongs. One of them is, right. this is what we think is true today, but more research may undo it later. Mm -hmm. And so you th I say, well, three years ago, I got, I got that wrong because that's the best we knew at the time. That's yeah. different from blunder, where you just simply say something that's just flat out wrong and someone yep. calls, calls you out later on. So that's a more of an embarrassing kind of error. So do, should that person move to the cave forever? I would say, remember, every human is a human. Everyone makes mistakes. And, uh, you know, they say there's a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. One is like uh, too afraid to make make mistakes. Other is like, I make a mistake and I move on from it. So I think the best thing you can do is admit your wrongs, apologize for them sincerely and put out a correction. And, and so, so we have to work on that mindset. That's a mindset I that people so. fear, I think, because yes. they don't, you know, what, what is it they said that the scariest thing, even scarier than death is speaking in public yes. for some people. Yeah. I, I never understood that because I, I never had an issue with that. I mean, 
you think people would rather be at the front of the room at their own funeral than <laughs> giving the eulogy at somebody <laughs> exactly. else's. Then in the front of the room of a, of a full house. Uh, right. Okay. Yeah. And so, I mean, unless there is a sniper or you're going to die straight up of a heart attack at the speaking podium, you'll be fine. I always say that, um, <laughs> you know, the we're definitely so afraid of things that can't hurt us. I remember I made a flow chart once of like, can this thing kill you? If yes, run. If no, chill out. Those are the basics. I did an episode. I love with, that um, flow chart. It's a great flow chart. It, I use it all the time. But I did an episode, um, two-parter, called Fearology with someone named Mary Poffinroth. And she is an expert in fear and the amygdala and how we react to fear. And it was life-changing. She is so great. And she essentially said most of our fears and anxiety and stress is just worry that we're not good enough. And so if you think about everyone walking around worrying that they're not good enough to do their job or follow their dreams or start a conversation or a podcast or correct their mistakes, then, you know, that's a whole lot of stress that we have that we can. So I got one for you, Chuck. Yeah. Ready? What flat, what flat earthers fear most is sphere itself. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) Oh. By by the way, that joke made me believe the earth is flat. (laughs) <laughs> did you just come up with that or did you no I tweeted it? that a couple of years ago no, that's a and good, that's, no no it was I think it's been around it's been around but the I, only I, thing it's, it's we have to Twitter. fear is fear it's, itself is sphere it's itself sphere. actually I'm, it's I'm gonna tell you itself. something that's that's pretty damn clever so yep. yeah yeah it. that's good and it. it's the mm. it's fear it's sphere is what does it yeah mm-hmm. for the word play I like it all right. We got time. Maybe one more question. What else you got, Chuck? Yeah. All what right. You got? Let's go to Kayla Slaughter. Kayla says. Uh, By the way, these are all Patreon members, right? Ah. Yes, that is correct. And yeah, I'm yeah. glad you brought these that up, Patreon. Neil, because uh, let me just tell people that you can go to patreon.com slash star talk. Support us there. If you come in at a certain um, support level, um, we uh, we take your questions and we read them on the air, and that allows us to. I mean, they bribe it. us to ask, to ask their questions. That's yeah. what that is. That's what Listen, yeah. What, okay. Neither, neither, <laughs> nobody in this organization is a law enforcement official. We, <laughs> there is no law that says we cannot take bribes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go on. Next here, question. Here we go. She says, I'll be starting a family soon. I want to make sure my children have a well-rounded experience in science and politics and every all the ologies, basically. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts on how I can start early? I wish that paper encyclopedias were still around because I feel like when I was a kid, all I wanted was an encyclopedia shelf in our house just to take a volume and then just go sit under a tree with it. But I guess- So you're 75 years old. I'm one million that. years old. Yeah. I'm- uh... <laughs> That is good. <laughs> Back when we had paper, the books were made of paper. Right. You could smell them with your nose. We did have an old, we, we finally got one from a garage sale, but it was so outdated that it was like, one day- Human man will be on the moon, and I remember being like, mm-hmm. "Yes, yeah, I love that. I love the out of date things. They're fun. Yeah, They're fun. I know. They're cheap. Funny. But um, uh, mm-hmm. I would say, I would say, let them frolic. Let them frolic. Get them, get them a microscope because you start swabbing window sills and start looking at fly mouth parts. You start to realize the world is a lot bigger and smaller than we than we think. So I'd say, let them frolic. Fly mouth parts. That yeah. was very random right there. Of all the things of- you could have listed, <laughs> fly mouth parts. But I, I don't think- even, no, I'm, no I, I retract the question. I don't want to know how you came up with that in your list. Have you ever looked at them? What are you doing later today? Get yourself a microscope. Find a dead fly. Fly m- mouth parts. <laughs> you know? They just, they're thinking about them barfing on a sandwich and sucking oh, it back up. God. The world is big and small. It's beautiful. It's great. Get him a maybe. Get him a telescope and a yeah. microscope, and then so, so you so you want this should be free range, mm-hmm. free range children, yeah, with access to the large and the small, yes. And in um, those limits, there are no bounds. Nice. And I like. want to I want to make it known that I don't have kids. So okay, take this with a grain of salt because I don't know how to raise wait, wait, children. You, wait, you, you, we, we, I heard in offline that you have a dog. 
I do. I have an eight-year-old daughter. She's a poodle. So, and, yeah. and does does your eight-year-old poodle daughter ha- have a microscope? She does. Yeah, she has a microscope. <laughs> I well, Chuck, her. she doesn't have opposable thumbs. They're working on that. The, the She's doing thumb. great. She's got infrared goggles. I got her a uh, yeah an electron scanning microscope. We just keep it in the garage. Um, yeah, so she's she's got everything she needs. Uh, by the way, Excellent. Kayla has a, a follow up for you, Allie. She says, "What's it like talking to so many smart people all of the time?" And by the way, I love your shows, plural. She put. Oh. Well, yeah, thank there it you, is. Kayla. What it's like talking to smart people all the time is incredibly, incredibly humbling. So it's it's there's nothing better than being reminded that you're uh, the stupidest person in a conversation, and that's what I do for a living. It's great. Um, so yeah, I love it. That reminds me of a quote: "If you're the smartest person in the room, find another room." Yeah, <laughs> that's a good. That's, saying. What, that, that's what you're saying here, Ali. That's right? What I'm you're, saying. you're 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 reveling in the fact that every outing you learn something. Mm-hmm. And Absolutely. For so many people, the pain of learning something new is unbearable to them. Yeah. And so they stay steeped in their ignorance, ossified yes. from the graduation day from when they left school. That's Ooh. true. Oh Living in the God. past. Living All in right. a shell so of the that, former intelligence. That, is there such a thing as a stupid question? No. I really don't think so. I think if it's honest... If it's honest and vulnerable, it's not stupid, and chances are someone else in the room has it. And we're all going to die anyway. We're all going to be bones and dust, and a fungus is going to eat your, us. <laughs> yes. That's your... <laughs> that's how I live my life. Cut bangs. Wow, that's very blunt, but true. We're all going to die. You're going to be powder. That no is... one's going to remember you. I don't even remember my great-grandparents' name. So why would I be like, I don't want to ask this question about uh, you know, solar power or about the universe. Wow. No one's going to remember Can I quote you on me. that? Yes. Okay. Someone said, well, I'm afraid to do this. You're going to die anyway. You're going to die. So you're going to die. Literally a question. fungus. You're going to die anyway. There your, you go. <laughs> your fungus lunch at the end of the day, ask a question and learn something. Who, If someone laughs, they're a jerk. So it's great. Just do your life. All right. Wait a minute. I got to tell, <laughs> okay, so tell the story real quick. Because okay. speaking of stupid questions now, you just reminded me, you're going to die. Right. Okay. I have, I have evidence to refute that. We're somewhere outdoors. It's Neil and I and these people who are huge fans. They come over. They're talking to him. He's being very, very gracious, spending way too much time talking to him. And so the guy says, hey, do you have one of those apps on your phone where you can hold it up to the sky and it will show you constellations? And then Neil goes like this. Are you kidding me right now? And I was like, yeah, bro, he is the app. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, are you insane? You're asking asking Neil deGrasse Tyson, does he need an app on his phone to look at the night sky? I'm like, brother, he is the app. What is your problem? Yes. Yeah, my answer is, in my day, we had to remember where the constellations were. (laughs) I still, I think, embarrassing moment for him, but still, there's a lot of stars up there. If anyone's taught us that, it's you. So he learned something about you that he that your brain has even more capacity than he ever imagined. All and right. also, he learned he needs the app. You don't. <laughs> yeah, thank you. There you go. Okay. And this bit about being fungus lunch, I'm trying to decide whether that's a happy <laughs> note or a sad note. It is. It's amazingly liberating. It's. I did a whole episode on thanatology death and dying, one of the happiest episodes I did. I came out of there saying, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. So yeah, <laughs> okay. your fungus lunch, ask a question, do your thing, uh, follow your passion, you know, uh, read the encyclopedia. It's all fine. And remember, there you're delicious. You're delicious. <laughs> to some organism, you're delicious. <laughs> yeah. All right, we got to take a quick break. But when we come back, more Stock Talk with Ali Ward. Hey, Star Talk fans. This next segment of our episode with Algae's host, Ali Ward, is sponsored by the all electric Chevrolet Bolt EUV, the everyday electric vehicle for everyday people. That's you. The all electric Chevy Bolt EUV has so many cool features, including the ability to engage in conversations hands free with the industry's first hands free driving assistance technology. You can find out more at Chevrolet.com slash electric slash bolt dash EUV. All right, let's get back to the show. We're back, Star Talk Cosmic Queries. And for this segment, we're going to actually devote this 
to a discussion about electric cars. Yes. Chuck, what do you yes. think of that? Yes, that's awesome. Because I know you don't like the word awesome, but in this case, I think it is awe-inspiring. Well, just to be awesome. clear, I, I love the word awesome, but when properly applied, like when you discover a new universe or something. But okay. <laughs> when people say, it would be awesome if you could pass the salt, that is not a good use of the word awesome. Okay, <laughs> okay just here to be is clear. a good use of the word awesome because electric vehicles actually do so much to help the environment. And I care about the environment. I know you do. People don't think I do, but this segment we're doing in partnership with the all new Chevrolet Bolt EUV. So I'm just over the moon because we get to talk about electric vehicles, man. And that's our future. All right. So this EUV, is that like SUV except electric? Is that how we're yeah, going to think about that? Yeah, man. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Doesn't I'm it sound smart. better See? though? Doesn't it sound better to be like EUV? EUV? You know, the UV. Ooh, yeah. Ooh. So, yeah. Let's get back uh, to our, our, our guest here, Ali Ward from Ologies, who basically did a did a land grab on all Ologies in the universe. Nice. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a straight power move. <laughs> that's a, it's a that's total gangster right there. Yep. It's <gasps> like, I, Once you get the ology, handle, you're sitting on it and it's yours. But yeah, this would be mm. electric vehicle technology, I suppose. The the segment could be. Oh, uh, the ology, okay. All the right, there you go. You just cram that ology in whether or not it belongs. Yep, that's it's what I do. <laughs> Someone mentions something in casual conversation and I tell you what ology it is. Right. But this one is really exciting to me. I've been excited about um, electric vehicles since I was a kid. My, my dad is really into alternative sources of power and solar power. And so I have been watching for years and seeing how EVs come on the market. So I'm really excited about the Chevrolet Bolt EV. I think oh, okay. EV yeah, is well, a good cool. move too. I like the way it sounds. And But is it like a hundred grand like other electric vehicles? Like what's going yeah, on that, there? That's the great thing about it's, it. I, otherwise it's not for everybody. You can't take that Chevy to the levee. If it costs that much, nobody's <laughs> <laughs> no good old boys are doing that. So what's, right, yeah. Well, that's why uh, they drain the levy. What's the price the point on this? That's why they drain the levy was to pay for your very expensive, which this is not actually. When I said it's accessible, that's what I mean. It's uh, you know this is a a car that allows people to enter into this realm, and if you're a conscientious as, person, as a first to four array. Okay, very yeah. good, very good. Yeah. So, so Ali, do you have a question related to this? I do, actually. I wanted to Wait, wait, know. wait. Actually, that's not fair because you're our guest and yes. we usually take questions from the audience, from our fan base. But, but you know, you seem so into it. Maybe we'll give you the occasion to ask the question with the okay. permission of our fan base. I think they'll allow it. Okay, go ahead. So the floor is mine. I have the Cosmic Query conch right now and can <laughs> launch a it? question. Uh -huh. Okay, so I wanted to talk about whether or not electric vehicles are good for the environment. How much good do they do over a car that runs on fossil fuels? What are your thoughts oh. on Oh, yeah, yeah. So I can, I mean, I, I don't claim to be the world's expert on that, but I can get you a lot of the way towards an answer to that question. Mm -hmm. So uh, here, here's the problem. Transportation today, you know, cars and trucks and things that, that, that move commerce, I guess even trains, but some trains are electric. So let's just stick to the ones that have sort of engines that burn fossil fuels. Uh, the, the problem is, if you have a car that takes gasoline, it can only run on gasoline, mm -hmm. right? So if so, if you run out of gas, you got to go to a gas station and fill it up with gasoline. So, you know, we all know how much gas costs and we know where it comes from in the world. And we know if a pipeline gets shut down and we know if a war breaks out and if we know if, a, uh, if an oil well is on fire and we know if, if there's new regulation related to it. So oil has become a strategic commodity simply because we need it to run our transportation grid. So now in comes an electric car. So in an electric car, of course, it still uses power. All right. So so what's up with that? Why is it good rather than sort of neutral or bad or equal? Right. So here's what happens. You got your car and it's at home and you plug it in. OK. Now it's getting electricity from your power plant. There's a chance your power plant is using coal. There's a good chance of that. All right. So that's not really much better. All right. Coal, burning coal or burn, burning gasoline. There's still this carbon footprint. OK. Mm -hmm. However, the power plant is not limited to just coal. If they wanted to, 
and many have, they can put in, if they have sunlight where you are, a, a, a solar farm or a wind, a wind farm. And if you're near water, you could be hydroelectric. All of these sources of power can be generated by your power company and show up in your wall socket. Mm -hmm. So you don't need 12 different engines in your car to use 12 different kinds of energy. You just right. need a plug mm -hmm. that gives you access to the thing that's generating the energy 12 different ways. So if you electrify the transportation grid, you are future-proofing our path in, into a, a, a culture and a civilization that can wean itself off its dependence of fossil fuels. And so that's why it works. That's mm -hmm. why it's good. I like that answer. Not to mention, if you go solar on your house, you essentially have a solar-powered car, there which is a car oh, oh, powered yeah. by the sun. There you go. I, Exactly. There's got to be a bumper so, sticker for that, <laughs> like solar-powered vehicle. <laughs> yeah, but that wouldn't work in places like Seattle where the sun never comes out or upstate New York. Um, but yeah, you, it, it would be believable if it's in a place where the sun is, is prevalent. So, yeah. so that's why uh, electric is good. Now, mm -hmm. the problem is I can have a gallon of gas over here and I can move it over there where you need it, mm -hmm. okay? You, you can't with do you. that with electricity. You can't carry electricity with you. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. you can charge a battery and then I can move the battery over there. No, the battery's in the car, okay? Yeah. So, so one of the problems with electricity as it's generated is it can only, you can't sort of store it outside of the battery that's in your car. Mm -hmm. So to run your lights, to run most of the things that civilization uses electricity for, it doesn't come out of a storage battery. It's generated on the fly as you need it yeah. from the power station and delivered by the, the high tension lines. I was going to say, like, I'm glad you said that because there's a lot of people who are, you know, um, electric vehicle hesitant, I will say, because mm -hmm. they're worried about how far they can drive, like because of what you just said. And the cool thing uh, about the industry, but more importantly about the Chevy Bolt EUV is the because I know this because I got to take a tour of the car with GM. But the cool thing is this car has nearly 250 mile range on a full charge. 250. Okay? Right. Is good. And then, That's good. That'll get you between any adjacent cities. I mean, New York City yeah. is 250 between uh, Boston and Washington. Right. And, and you're in L.A., Ali. What what yeah. cities with it? You, uh, San Diego is easy. Oh, um, OK. If you need to make a getaway, that's Palm Springs, that's Joshua Tree, that's Santa Barbara, that's, yeah. Oh, excuse me, Coast. Joshua Tree. Oh, oh excuse me. Goodness. Okay. Yeah. I mean, These are oh, different hangouts. Excuse me, I'm about to take my Chevrolet Bolt EUV down to the Joshua Tree. Hmm. I mean, Perhaps you'd like I've to got meet an me there. Shoot. Sometimes you need an Instagram shoot and you need to get in your Bolt. I love the EUVs. I think mm -hmm. if you like a hatchback with a little bit higher profile, um, I, yeah, I love that. And the range is great. They call it range anxiety. People who are afraid to go EV because they think they're going to be stranded. But once you drive an electric, it's kind of like once you become a bird watcher, you start seeing all these charging stations, just like you would see birds you didn't realize were there before. But right. once you drive an EV, it's uh, like, oh, there's a char they're everywhere. You can charge yeah. in parking lots at the mall. You can charge next to your grocery store. You can charge at hotels. It's just like... Wait, so the really bird watcher easy. and analog there is... If you've never looked for a bird, you would never know it was there until you knew what to look for. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then they're everywhere. I got you. Yeah. Okay. So that's yeah. just like a psychological effect. Yeah. Sort of. Once you know what to look for. But yeah, there's EV charging stations everywhere. Yeah, there's um, about 40,000 mm -hmm. uh, birds to look for <laughs> when you're traveling. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> is that how many, is that how many uh, EV stations are there? Yeah. Yeah. There's really? about 40,000 public charging stations. So... You know, That's you can okay. So, so Chuck, which which goes faster down the road, a, a Chevy Bolt or Usain Bolt? You know, uh, I'm going to say that the Usain Bolt is faster out of the blocks, but the Chevy Bolt is going to ultimately <laughs> smoke them. <laughs> don't tell him that. Exactly. <laughs> Not to mention, you don't need as many carbs for your Chevy Bolt. You yeah, can. You don't have to run it on pasta protein, anything. I think range. Oh, I got you. There range. you go. Mm -hmm. Better yeah, range. Yeah. For sure. So was that the, that's your only question you had? 
I well, that about. was my main question about it. I think, um, you know, people who are considering going from a fossil fuel car to something that is electric, I think tend to be people who are environmentally conscious. And so they really want to know how much better is this for the environment. But knowing that I, you I can agree. Use- and those are the people who do it first. But ultimately, yeah. if you get the right price point, people just do it because it's the right yeah. price point. Right. Yeah. Oh, right. wait. Mention, so then, yeah. uh, you know, speaking of what you just said, before we actually got on the show today, Ali was doing something on oh, your yeah. computer where you were like looking at the savings. So when you talk about price point, there are hidden savings in every electric vehicle. Uh, but I don't know. Do you have do, what, what yeah. were you doing? Well, there are fewer moving parts. Oh, can I can I back up real quick? We're running yeah. out of time. I don't want to take up the whole thing. But okay. but uh, Michael Faraday, go back a hundred and. Yeah. 50, 60 years. When you said back, uh, I thought bas- you meant back in the show. <laughs> <laughs> no, You're no, like, no. can I go back? go back? Michael Faraday. <laughs> <laughs> so Michael Faraday, uh, an English scientist, a physicist, uh, he basically is responsible for figuring out how to generate electricity. Right. Okay? And he, he invented the concept of an electric field, right. by the way, because that's not a thing you can touch, right? It's just this thing there. And... So he can draw it and calculate, you can calculate with it. So he, he realized that if you move a wire through a magnetic field, it induces current in that wire and you can, it'll show up on a meter. And so, whoa, well, that's kind of, it was a little novel at the time, but what would you do with this? This is kind of a stupid toy. And then people figure, oh my gosh, this is the birth of the electrification of the world. Point is, the way we do that now is we have a tightly wound uh, in a, what's called a turbine, a tightly wound wire coil that spins in a magnetic field and an electric um, uh, a current is induced in that wire. Ever since the beginning of electricity, we've known how to spin things. That's, that's what we do best. We've been doing it for 150 years. And what is a car, if not electricity, spinning things? So the acceleration on an electric vehicle can be excellent mm. because of this fact. And that's why the Chevy Bolt, I, I didn't check the acceleration numbers. They might actually accelerate out of the blocks faster than Usain Bolt now that, now that I'm thinking about it. Mm. So. Well, also, uh, I was checking on price point stuff just to see how much would I save per year driving an EV. And my parents live about 400 miles away. So I go up a, a couple times, obviously, like every month or two. And I would save $10,000 over five years on gas, Whoa, <laughs> just okay. based on that, the, which is, yeah. Um, yeah, if you're calculating- Not to how mention much, how much CO2 that is, right. But, I know. Right. So right. a little karmically mm-hmm. and then pocketbook wise. But yeah, I, I did, they have a number cruncher for you. So you don't have to, uh-huh. uh, you don't have to pull out your spreadsheets. They have it for you. I see what you did when you say karma. Karmically. Oh, no. yes, you like that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Karmically. Electric. Yeah, yeah. The puns are electric. <laughs> so, guys, we got to land this plane or park this car. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ali, has been delight to have you on this show. I oh. can't believe we haven't had you ever on before. We got to do this again I with know. your permission. Yes. And talk about some of the ologies that you've, you've discovered, or I think you're inventing some of those ologies, well, really. Maybe, maybe bending I some think words. I think. I think you're pulling them out of I don't know where. Okay. I, swear, I swear I do look for I do look for them in the literature first. I promise. But right. yes, so All many right. ologies right. to cover. I'm here whenever you need me. So. And so little time. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for being on Star Talk. Thank you. And you, you can catch her on her ology podcast, mm-hmm. and um, it goes everywhere. I mean, every ology you can ever imagine. It's even the ones you haven't imagined because she made them up. They're there. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Chuck, always good to have you, man. Hey, Neil, before we wrap up, I just want to let the viewer know that if you're ready to make the electric future part of your present and do some good for the environment, which is what it is all about, check out the Chevrolet Bolt EUV at Chevrolet.com slash electric. Chevrolet.com slash electric. Do some good, people. Come on. All right. This has been Star Talk. Cosmic Aquarius, Neil deGrasse Tyson here. As always, keep looking up.